Is it possible that our present civilization is actually losing the ability to think? I'm told we live in an information age, so we have no shortage of things to think about. But how much contemplation, how much actual reflective thinking do any of us do anymore? That's what we're going to look at today on Authentic. This is probably going to be hard for some people to believe, but political debates back in the 19th century were a completely different animal from the political debates that we get now in the 21st century. Today, political candidates are asked to give their policy position in two minutes or less, and sometimes they need to be even briefer than that if they're delivering a rebuttal. And so what we get is a rather crass media event where the entertainment value seems to be more important than the actual content of a political candidate's position. It's all about sound bites and witticisms. But compare that to the way that political debates went down in the 1800s and you're in for a bit of a shock. It was considered completely normal for a candidate to elaborate on their platform for three or more hours before their opponent gave a rebuttal for another several hours. Back in the 19th century, a political debate could go all day and well into the evening. In this famous 1985 book about the way that communication has changed since the advent of television, Neil Postman tells the story of Abraham Lincoln who actually stopped a debate so that people could go home and eat supper before coming back to hear the rest of it. He writes this, On October 16, 1854, in Peoria, Illinois, Douglas delivered a three-hour address to which Lincoln, by agreement, was to respond. When Lincoln's turn came, he reminded the audience that it was already 5 p.m., that he would probably require as much time as Douglas, and that Douglas was still scheduled for a rebuttal. He proposed, therefore, that the audience go home, have dinner, and return refreshed for four more hours of talk. The audience amiably agreed, and matters proceeded as Lincoln had outlined. I mean, can you imagine a modern audience agreeing to that? Most of us have trouble sitting through a three-minute YouTube video because it seems so unreasonably long, let alone all-day monologues dealing with policy. I've actually seen recommendations from so-called communications experts telling us that YouTube videos should never, ever be more than two minutes long because that's the attention span that most of us have. Now, if that's true, that means that most of us now have the attention span of a goldfish. And I'm not sure that's a good thing when we live in a world with very complex problems that require a lot of careful thought. I mean, let's really think about this. All a person really has time to do in a couple of minutes is make an impression. And it's almost always going to be a purely aesthetic impression because in reality, nobody can explain or explore a complex issue in just 120 seconds. What we seem to want in our current world is not a rational discourse designed to deepen our understanding. What we're looking for is a media moment a little bit of entertainment designed to be vaguely memorable. Maybe one of the most famous examples of how the shift to visual media in the 20th century changed how we think is the infamous Nixon-Kennedy debate of 1960, the first presidential debate to ever be televised. 70 million out of roughly 110 million people tuned in to watch this event. And by all measures, it looked like Nixon was poised to win the election. But Nixon had just come back from the hospital where he'd been treated for a knee injury. And he managed to re-injure that knee as he made his way on stage. And that's when he made a fatal mistake. He refused to wear any stage makeup, which made him look awful in front of the camera. On the other hand, Kennedy was tanned and relaxed and his own team had given him stage makeup right before he went on air. Nixon had a five o'clock shadow and the hot stage lights made the sweat on his forehead glisten. And at that point, it didn't matter who had the better policies. Kennedy simply looked more attractive 
And a lot of people now think that Nixon lost the debate mostly because of how he looked. In the past, most Americans only knew their presidential candidates through the written word, so how they looked was pretty much irrelevant. In fact, one author I recently read suggested that if any one of the first 15 American presidents had walked down a street in broad daylight, most people would never recognize them because they had no idea what the president looked like. Now, there are people who still argue that the 1960 debate was not really a matter of style over substance and that Kennedy won on the weight of his arguments. But still, it's obvious that the shift toward visual communication made personal aesthetics much more important than they used to be. I mean, let's go back to the Lincoln-Douglas debate one more time and just think about this. Very few people really thought Abraham Lincoln was good looking. And back in 1858, nobody actually cared. Today, if a man like Lincoln wanted to run for office, he would be subjected to image consultants who might even suggest a little plastic surgery to improve his odds at the ballot box. So let's take that thought. And now let's move to the world of religion. If you go back just a little bit to the era before TV, radio, or the internet, you'll notice something fascinating. The biggest names in Christianity were people who were known for their ideas and not for their image. If I mention people like Jonathan Edwards or George Whitefield or Charles Finney, most of you wouldn't be able to picture them in your mind unless you happen to be a history buff. These were people known for their ideas. They were mostly intellectual giants whose sermons would be considered exceptionally boring to a 21st century audience. When these guys got into a pulpit, they gave long and reasoned discourses that required some mental energy on the part of the congregation. And today, by comparison, a lot of people think of Christian preachers as being anti-intellectual. And I think to some extent, they're probably right. I'll have to admit, it's embarrassingly difficult to flip through the channels on a Sunday morning and come to the conclusion that TV preachers are, in fact, intellectually discerning intellectuals. But back in the days of Jonathan Edwards, nobody could make that argument. Edwards presented some of the best reasoned defenses for the Christian faith the world had ever heard to that point. The most notable preachers of the First and Second Great Awakenings were shaped by the influence of the Enlightenment and the Protestant Reformation, both of which were movements that prov promoted careful reason and rational discourse. But then came the advent of radio, and then TV, and then online distribution platforms, and it was accompanied by a rapid shift toward the entertainment value of information instead of its actual utility. I mean, let's be brutally honest. Let's just think about the best-known preachers of the mid-20th century onward, and I think you'll see what I mean. Chances are you remember their physical appearance and their style faster than you can remember the content of what they said. And by the time we got to the 1980s, it was pretty much all about style instead of substance. Now, of course, I am saying this as a TV and radio preacher, so it is a world I know. And on the one hand, I suppose there is something to be said for a church that keeps up with the times. If the average Westerner is shifting away from reading to other forms of media, then in a lot of ways, it really is the job of the church to meet people where they are. I mean, that is how this ministry started back in 1929, when HMS Richards took to the air with a show he called The Tabernacle of the Air, which later became the voice of prophecy, and that's the parent organization for this show. And back in 1929, there were lots of critics who suggested that going on the radio was never, ever going to work. They said that all these new forms of media were antithetical to the work of the Christian church. And HMS, of course, prove them completely wrong, and here we are today, almost a hundred years later, still going strong. But at the same time, I want you to notice how I just called what we're doing here a show. Because in the minds of most people, that's what this is. It's a show, not a sermon, not a discourse, a show. And in order to make what I'm doing even semi-palatable for a 21st century audience, we have to sink a lot of money into things like lighting so that this program, in spite of my face, is at least a little bit visually acceptable. Because we all know if it doesn't look good, if it doesn't look professional, very few people are going to stick around to hear what I have to say. 
And maybe that's where the early critics of HMS Richards might have been a itty bitty right, so stick around. I'll tell you what they did get right. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Personally, I think Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, is a masterpiece. This is one of my favorite books. And even though he published it in 1985, I think it's probably more relevant today than when it first came off the press. In fact, I think the emergence of social media only serves to confirm Postman's suspicion that electronic media is changing how we think. Things like reasoned discourse and careful reflection have mostly disappeared in a fast-paced world that now prizes entertainment more than anything else. And he spends a great deal of time explaining how that shift has changed the world of religion. After sitting down to watch 42 hours of religious TV in the 1980s, Postman came to a number of important conclusions. One of the first things he said is that he could have watched five hours instead of 42 because so much of what he was watching was pretty much identical. But then he makes two important observations, and I'll share just one of them with you. He writes, The first is that on television, religion, like everything else, is presented quite simply and without apology as an entertainment. Everything that makes religion an historic, profound, and sacred human activity is stripped away. There is no ritual, no dogma, no tradition, no theology, and above else, no sense of spiritual transcendence. On these shows... The preacher is tops. God comes out as second banana. You know, as much as I hate to admit it, I think he's absolutely right, especially when it comes to American Christianity. Here in the West, personalities are just about everything. I mean, just think of your favorite preachers. Most of the time, it's the personality of the speaker that pulls you in and keeps you watching, with very few exceptions. And that's not to say there's something wrong with these preachers, because in a lot of ways, the media they're using, whether it's TV or the Internet, demands that they be at least a little entertaining in order to be heard. It's just the tragic nature of 21st century mass communication. There is so much media content being generated every single day that it's hard to keep up. More than 2.5 quintillion bytes are added to the Internet every 24 hours and most people feel like they have to do something entertaining to just get noticed. Exhibit A might be TikTok, where screaming for attention seems to be the modus operandi. So in some ways, I can't really blame people for the way things are going. But at the same time, I, I can't help but feel sorry about the incredible price we've paid for this so-called advancement in the world of information. I mean, the key source of information for the Christian is this book, the Bible. And this is something that cannot be reduced to a five-minute TED Talk or a two-minute YouTube video. It's not possible, at least not without reducing these ideas to absurdity. So when I see the way that people use the Bible on social media, I'll have to admit it kind of breaks my heart. Religious discourse in the world of Twitter or Facebook essentially comes down to a game of gotcha, where the wittiest comeback seems to win the day, or where the loudest voice gets all the attention. Profound concepts like the nature of free will, or the character of God, or the nature of human existence, or the definition of sin and salvation, or the concept of justice, well, they all get reduced to sound bites snippets of information or a memorable catchphrase that gives lie to the complexity of what the Bible's actually talking about. And if it's not packaged attractively, being presented by someone considered culturally influential, then it doesn't get any traction. What's happening right now in the world of thought kind of reminds me of little kids at Christmas who would rather play with the pretty box the present was wrapped in than the expensive toy inside. I mean, Try to imagine the Apostle Paul presenting his message in America on Sunday morning television, or even on a platform like Twitter. 
For starters, everything we know about Paul suggests that he was probably not that attractive. No flashy teeth, no magnificent mane of TV hair, no designer suit. In fact, there's an ancient non-biblical work that was written either in the first century or maybe a little after that, and it has a description of Paul that goes like this. It says, And a certain man named Onesiphorus, hearing that Paul was coming to Iconium, went out speedily to meet him, together with his wife Lectra and his sons Simea and Zeno, to invite him to their house. For Titus had given them a description of Paul's personage, they as yet not knowing him in person, but only being acquainted with his character. So you'll notice, they know what he stands for, but not what he looks like. It continues, They went into the king's highway to Lystra and stood there waiting for him, comparing all who passed by with that description which Titus had given them. At length they saw a man coming, namely Paul, of a low stature, bald or shaved on the head, crooked thighs, handsome legs, hollowed-eyed, and had a crooked nose. Now, of course, that's not part of the inspired body of Scripture, so you can't just take this at face value. And the church father Tertullian actually condemns some of this book's teachings as outright heresy. But what we should understand is that the bishop who wrote this said he was writing that to honor Paul. And I suspect that if this was written today, there's no way the author would include a physical description of Paul that was anywhere south of flattering. But times were different back then. I mean, just compare that to some of the more popular preachers of our day, and I think you'll see what I mean. Western Christians have come to expect perfect haircuts, expensive suits, whitened teeth, and all the trappings of material success. And I have a sneaking hunch that Paul might have had a harder time getting traction today than he did back in the first century. Then add to that the weight of Paul's writing, the sheer mental discipline required not only to write it, but to read it and understand it. Paul's letters are very careful and brilliant bits of reasoning that wouldn't work as a TED Talk or a 280-character tweet. And all of these letters, including the incredibly complex book of Romans, were designed to read out loud in church, which means that the average Christian audience in the first century had a really good attention span, even though the majority of them did not come from educated backgrounds. I mean, can you imagine a modern audience sitting through a reading of the Book of Romans and understanding every single word? I mean, it's not like this is easy stuff, because even the Apostle Peter complained about the brain power needed to wrap your head around the stuff that Paul was writing. Here's what Peter said about the people who were taking Paul's writings and twisting them to make them say what they wanted. He says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, that's the second coming, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures." So what exactly am I driving at? Well, I've got to take a really quick break, but don't you go anywhere, because I'll tell you what I'm driving at in just a moment. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. You know, there's an interesting and rather famous passage in the book of Isaiah that looks forward into the future and predicts Messiah. And, and here's what it says at one point. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In other words, Messiah would not be physically attractive. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. 
You know, when you go back and read the physical descriptions of Jesus written down by some of the earliest Christians, and you read what ancient church fathers like Origen or Clement said, it's not at all what you would expect after watching all the Jesus movies made in the 20th century. We like to think of Jesus as a movie star, but the ancients didn't think that Jesus was actually attractive. I mean, here's a description that comes from an old Russian version of the writings of Josephus, and honestly, it's not actually likely that Josephus wrote this. It's probably the work of an ancient Christian who slipped these words into the manuscript when nobody was looking. But it does demonstrate that this idea that Jesus was some kind of dreamy-looking Hollywood celebrity with a golden mane and blue eyes, well, that's not how early Christians thought about Him at all. I mean, if they did, why in the world would a practicing Christian slip this account into Josephus' manuscript? He wrote, he was a man of simple appearance, mature age, dark skin, short growth, three cubits tall, that's only about four and a half feet, hunchbacked with a long face, a long nose, eyebrows meeting above the nose so that the spectators could take fright with scanty hair, but having a line in the middle of the head after the fashion of the Nazareans and with an undeveloped beard. Now, again, there's a lot of reason to doubt that this was real because after all, Whoever wrote it was trying to pass this off as the work of Josephus, so we're dealing with a less than honest person. So if there's any truth there, it's probably a gross exaggeration, but the fact remains that most early Christians did not think Jesus was handsome. And that does line up with what Isaiah predicted. And if that's the case, you've got to wonder how the Son of God would have fared in a 21st century media environment. I mean, He wasn't even what you and I would consider financially successful. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, Jesus told the scribes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. So you got to wonder, how in the world would Jesus build an audience if He'd come to the world in the 21st century? And of course, by now some of you are wondering, what is the point of this discussion? Really, it's pretty simple. Our generation has been gradually conditioned away from the art of reasoned thought, and unfortunately it seems to be getting worse by the day. We want our information in 30 second sound bites, about the length of a commercial, and we want it right now. A lot of people get irritated if they send someone a text message and they don't get an answer in a few minutes. And if it takes more than three minutes to think about something, it seems like we just don't want to expend the effort. And tragically, this seems to be creeping into the arena of religion, which used to be the one place that always demanded deep thought and careful reflection. The issues that the Bible addresses are not light and trifling. These are not things that can be easily explained with witticisms and catchphrases. But what has happened is that we've created a bumper sticker religion out of something that was thousands of years in the making. You know, I've spent a lot of time over the last three decades teaching the Bible publicly, and more and more I'm finding that people want a quick answer to even the most difficult question, because they've become accustomed to assessing ideas with nothing but a brief glance. They want all the thoughts you find here in the Bible boiled down into short, easy-to-digest commercials. But unfortunately, for the things that matter most in life, that's just not the way it works. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, God says, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That means you're going to have to invest a little time if you really want to understand the heart and mind of God. And I can promise you that will not be a fruitless pursuit. In Proverbs 8 verse 17, God says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Look, I know at this point I'm probably sounding like some kind of techno-peasant or a Luddite, but let me assure you, I'm very, very glad for the advent of digital media. I'm a huge fan of podcasts, 
And I'm a huge fan of radio, as my wife can tell you, because I listen to something on the radio all night, every single night. I'm thankful for platforms like Facebook and Twitter because they allow me to keep in touch with family members who live on the other side of the planet. And Twitter, to some degree, lets you see what's happening on the ground when major events take place, like the Arab Spring. I was able to follow it in real time. And the gatekeepers in those cases can't keep the truth from getting out. But at the same time, I, I do think we're losing something important. And that's the gift of patient, reasonable discourse. The rapid-fire overabundance of information we now live with has given us the impression that everything, every little bit of data we're exposed to has equal importance. And it doesn't. Sometimes you've got to ask yourself, as you're consuming vast amounts of data, how much of a difference is it really going to make to the rest of your day or the rest of your life? How much of what you're looking at really, really counts? How much is actually going to improve your life. When it comes to the world of religion, I think that information overload has done an incredible amount of damage. Online religious discussions usually deteriorate into shouting matches, with both sides trying to score points with very little intellectual honesty. And overall, I think we're losing our ability to reason our way through complex ideas in a systematic way. And maybe worst of all, we never ever seem to have the time for quiet reflection. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a challenge. I'm going to challenge you to go on a digital fast. Take a whole day, 24 hours, and turn the digital world completely off. Do it. Turn off your laptop. Turn off your smartphone. Turn off your radio, your TV set, and take the time to reflect on your life. You know, the Bible actually prescribes a, a weekly Sabbath where you put aside the whole world for an entire day and you just listen for the voice of God. And I'm suggesting maybe it's time to do that again. Turn it all off. Maybe grab a copy of the Bible and just read it for yourself. Not books about the Bible, but read it for yourself carefully and slowly. Ask questions. Take notes. And if you need a little help getting started, go over to BibleStudies.com where I have all kinds of free resources waiting to help you get started. Maybe just give yourself the space to think, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by what the Bible actually says, because this is not just entertainment. I dare you, 24 hours, and if you can swing it, start doing it every single week, and give yourself the time and space you need to rebuild an authentic human life. I'm Sean Boonstra. Thanks again for joining me.